In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Welcome, everyone, to Crime and Punishment, a legal podcast, the official podcast of the Invictus Law Firm PA, a criminal defense law for, firm here in Orlando, Florida, the website for which is AugustusInvictus.com, and that is me, yours truly, the host of this program. Today we're talking about politics. Did I say politics? I meant law. I uh, completely forgot to copy and paste the, the viral style and the email thing. So if you go to AugustusInvictus.com, <clears throat> you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you will see there's a place for you to enter your email address, and that's how we give you the newsletter. So please do that. In the meantime, here's the viral style link and the website address in the YouTube. Good afternoon from the East, Garbage Takes. White Student Transmission, been a long time, buddy. I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. Um, welcome. So, let's talk about a couple things. First of all, I got a little carried away last week, perhaps. Uh, this is typically a family-friendly show. Uh, I think I used profanity three times last week. But I take the Ram case rather personally, as I said. We're going to talk about that case again today and the most recent developments uh, since we broadcast last time. I'm going to try not to use profanity today. Um, Monday night, this coming Monday, which is March uh, 4th, I will be on Radical Agenda with Chris Cantwell. We're going to talk about the Rise Above Movement case. We might, uh, well, we are, I talked to him earlier today, we are going to talk about the Charlottesville case. Um... We'll address both those things here, but uh, we'll go in depth uh, with Chris on uh, Monday. Um, I'll post the link to the Twitter, which you should go to. I'm at Emperor Invictus on Twitter. I'm shadow banned, so you gotta just go check it out. But I promise you that thread is fire. So I posted the email link, I posted the viral style, I mentioned Twitter, and I think that's all the. Uh, the introductory preliminary remarks we've got. Let's get into a really fascinating thing for me as a legal nerd. Uh, when I go and I search certain pages every day to do the uh, social media posts, uh, looking for articles on uh, legal topics. And one I always go to, despite the fact that I despise the American Bar Association, I always go to their ABA journal because they've always got you know, relevant articles, as slanted as they may be. One uh, from yesterday, actually, that is really interesting, and really interesting because the ABA Journal actually uh, wrote about the other side for once, believe it or not, is about constitutional law professors and what a tough time they're having with a conservative Supreme Court. <clears throat> It's gold. They talk about two articles, one published by the New York Times, which I can't read because you have to have a subscription, and I categorically refuse to pay the New York Times for anything. And one from the Volok Conspiracy, which we will read because you don't need a subscription for that. So let's just read the ABA journals uh, about the New York Times, and then we'll go to the Volok Conspiracy. But it's an interesting headline and an interesting article. Is SCOTUS, that is the Supreme Court of the United States, is SCOTUS making it harder to teach constitutional law? Professors are depleted and taken aback by the velocity of change. So, let's back up a little. For those who haven't gone to law school, constitutional law is a required class. Last I checked, anyway. Who knows these days, right? Required class, first year of law school, you have to learn what the Constitution is. I mean, the entire legal system that we're fighting in, it's based on the Constitution. Love it or hate it, the Constitution is the foundation for American society and American jurisprudence. You have to know it. I personally like knowing the common law and the English law, where everything came from, and I like comparative law. My certificate in law school is from... Uh, my certificate is uh, international and comparative law. That's what I studied. <clears throat> my academic background was in international criminal law. 
that's all just, you know, extra. You have to know the Constitution in order to be a lawyer in America. Like I said, love it or hate it, the Constitution is the foundation of this entire thing we've got going on here that we call a country. So con law, or constitutional law, is a first-year class. you got to take it. These poor con law professors are now having a tough time because all the garbage they've been spouting for decades is going out the window real fast. So let's get to the article, shall we? The U.S. Supreme Court's, quote, hard right supermajority is using the doctrine of originalism to overturn established precedent, making it difficult for constitutional law professors grappling with rapid change that they think is unprincipled, according to an article in the New York Times. Now, it's got a hyperlink. We're not following it. I'm not paying them. We're just going to read the ABA's summary of that article. I don't remember it going into originalism, so let me explain that before we go forward. When they talk about the hard right supermajority in the Supreme Court, using the doctrine of originalism, <clears throat> what they're talking about is something made famous by Justice Scalia. May he rest in peace. And it's saying, you know, the Constitution isn't something we just look at willy-nilly in modern times and say, well, I think it means this. Well, no, I think it means that. And we vote on it. Instead, we need to look at the original intent of the Founding Fathers. The original intent of the framers of the Constitution, excuse me. What did they mean when they said X, Y, and Z in Section 3 uh, you know, of the Constitution? What did they mean when they adopted the Bill of Rights and made it part of the Constitution? What were they talking about? Not, not what was Professor Chemerinsky talking about in you know, 1995, but what were the framers thinking? When they did this way back then, when they established this country, that's what originalism means, roughly. I'm sure there's law professors who would love to make it a little more verbose, but that's basically what it is. So, the New York Times spoke with several constitutional law professors, including Professor Rebecca Brown of the University of Southern California. This, this is my favorite part. I hope you're sitting down. <laughs> Quote, while I was working on my syllabus for this course, I literally burst into tears. End quote, she told the New York Times author. Quote, I couldn't figure out how any of this makes sense. Why do we respect it? Why do we do any of it? I'm feeling very depleted by having to teach it. End quote. And that's the general thrust of this entire thing. Constitutional law professors... I'm 90% of whom, 95%, if I had to reckon a guess, are leftists, are feeling depleted and insulted and dismayed and every other negative word you can think of because they've got to teach these horrific opinions coming out of the U.S. Supreme Court right now. Why couldn't we just stay in the golden age of 1950 to 2022? I mean, that was a good 70-year stretch of nonsense. We could have just stuck with that. America just keeps getting better. But no, this hard-right supermajority in the U.S. Supreme Court, they're ruining everything. And now I'm having panic attacks, and I'm crying when I make my syllabus because I just can't keep up with this, this shift to the right. It's going so fast. It, there are some revealing comments that are coming up. Some of them about, you know, we just can't make sense of it. And, you know, there's no such thing as law anymore. It's all politics now. That might not sound alien to you, dear audience member, because we've been saying exactly that for the past three years on this program. There is no such thing as law anymore. It's all politics and we like to think that just happened, you know, since Charlottesville or since Obama or since whatever your crisis moment was. But look at Brown v. Board of Education. We're talking about 1950. We're talking about desegregation of the schools, which we just take for granted now. Like, obviously. <laughs> but you go back even further. Female suffrage. It's a 
God-given thing. We just assume, of course women have the right to vote. <laughs> Think of it this way. If an American lawyer were to say right now, women should not have the right to vote, women should not be lawyers, women should not be judges, which I'm not saying at all. This is just legal commentary. This is a hypothetical. I would never say anything like that. But if someone did say that, you can imagine they'd be blacklisted real fast. In fact, they might have a bar complaint. If they were a professor saying that, God forbid. But if they were a practicing lawyer and they were saying things like that, they'd find themselves in some hot water real fast. However, look at the other side of things. If you were an American lawyer in the year 1910 and you were saying, I think women should have the right to vote, you might be laughed at and all your respectable colleagues would think you're a whipped fool, and obviously your mother is telling you to say these things, but no one's going to file a bar complaint against you or have your license taken away to practice law or you know, try to put you in jail for it. That's where we are now. You can't say things like, it, we mentioned Chris Cantwell earlier, he had this outrageous article, which I absolutely do not agree with, by the way, saying that if you want to solve the gun violence problem in America, you should disarm black males. Because look at the statistics. We're not being honest when we talk about mass shootings and gun ownership and the Constitution and so on and so forth. Obviously, it's a problem with black males, according to Christopher Cantwell. But if you were to say the Constitution should apply to white men and only white men who own property should be practicing law, should be voting, etc., etc., should have these kind of rights, these kind of privileges, you wouldn't just be laughed at or, you know, shamed at the country club by your colleagues for saying something like that. They try to take your license away. They try to put you in jail. They try to convince your wife to turn against you and file false criminal charges against you. They will pull every dirty trick in the book to go after you for saying things like that, which is why I don't say them. So for these liberal constitutional law professors to start crying about the change to the right, the Supreme Court passing down these laws, and I just can't keep up with this jurisprudence, like, think about all the sane lawyer. You don't even have to say right wing, because, I mean, you look at JFK. He was a right wing maniac compared to Democrats of today. Just think of sane people, sane lawyers, sane law professors back in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. All the insane things that they had coming down from the United States Supreme Court, right? Like Roe v. Wade, for one. Not just unprecedented, but abominable. A crime against humanity. If those justices were still alive, they should be brought up on criminal charges for what they did in Roe v. Wade. Imagine how lawyers felt back then, in 1972, 1973, 1974, when that decision was coming out, and oh my God, how is this going to affect jurisprudence? How is it going to affect American society? And now we've seen how it affected everything. And now you're going to cry because these totally illegal, unconscionable opinions are being overturned. And they're going back to, well, what? hold on a second. What did the framers of the Constitution think? Huh? Maybe we should consider that and not go by these ivory tower, you know, academicians who have held law hostage for decades now. So, you know, Professor Rebecca Brown of the University of Southern California breaking out into tears while writing her syllabus is just it's so gratifying, quite frankly. It's like the day after Trump won, and it's all over the newspapers, and you hear people crying 
on NPR. Good. You, you shouldn't be a lawyer anyway, Rebecca Brown. You shouldn't be a law professor. But uh, that's according to some people, not to me. So what feels different at this moment, said Barry Friedman, a professor at the New York University School of Law, is the ambition and the velocity, how fast and aggressively it's happening. So Friedman's complaint, unlike uh, Rebecca Brown, who just thinks the whole thing is just so beyond comprehension that you just got to break down and cry. Barry Friedman is saying, well, you know, we're, our heads are spinning kind of because uh, of the ambition and the velocity, how fast and aggressively it's happening. And that could be a fair point. Because if you look at the liberal court from 1950 to, you know, 2022, to the Trump administration, from 1950 to the Trump administration, um, I don't mean the Trump administration, I mean the Trump appointed Supreme Court, like basically the Supreme Court that he made, I think is fair to say. You see this slow, torturous, undeniable juggernaut of a progression to pure Satanism. Now you start with something that no one can attack. Like, of course, this poor little African American girl has to go to school. You're a monster if you don't agree with that. You know, 20 years later, women are allowed to murder their own children. It didn't happen overnight. You're talking 20 years till we got to that point. And then from 1973 to, uh, when was Obergefell? 2013, I think. Maybe 20, maybe it was 2008. I don't know, somewhere. No, it had to be 2013 because Obama won in 2008. So what's that? 83, 93, 03, 30. You're talking 40 years. 40 years from women should be able to murder their own and have a right, a constitutional right to murder their own babies. 40 years from that to recognizing gay marriage. That's a, that's a long time. So 60 years from... We have to desegregate the schools to homosexuals have a right to be married. That did not happen overnight. That's what you call a long march. And for, the, for these Trump appointees to come in and boom, it's overnight they're overturning this, that, and the other. All their sacred cows are going out the window. You know, Friedman is right. It is aggressively happening, and it, it is high velocity. As an example, back to the article, the New York Times pointed to the June 2022 Supreme Court decision in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, which found a Second Amendment right to carry a handgun for self-defense outside the home. According to the New York Times writer, the decision, quote, featured the right-wing justices playing amateur historians, cherry-picking and distorting evidence from decades or centuries ago in order to justify their existing opinions, end quote. Then they go to Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean of University of California, Berkeley School of Law, and, surprise, an ABA Journal contributor. He addressed the same thing in a March 2022 podcast. Anyway, this other guy was on. He says, I think we're on the cusp of a disaster. I think we're seeing almost a virtual collapse of the ability to teach con law as law, Abramson said. This is the other guy from University of Texas. So... This is where we get into the really interesting sentiment that liberals are starting to say, maybe there is no such thing as law. Maybe it's all politics. Because from 1950 to the present day, they've had a long, long run where they just control everything judicially. And yeah, conservatives will stop them from this dastardly plot or, you know, pull them back a little from that one, but it's obviously been a dramatic, like, I mean, there, there are no words you could use that would be too exaggerative of the shift to the left since 1950. They've just, they've owned it all. For the first time since 1950, for real, 
they're starting to be like, oh my God, um, hold on. Has this all been politics or is it all politics now? Like we, we've been pretending for 70 plus years that this was all law. And clearly Chemerinsky, Abramson, uh, Rebecca Brown, I think her name is, they've never read Carl Schmidt before. I can guarantee that. Not just by their comments, but by the fact that Carl Schmidt is not allowed in American law schools. You take jurisprudence, you're going to learn Herbie Hart and all of his descendants, his students and the people who came after them, this lineage from Herbie Hart, the Jewish liberal, to the present day. You'll be lucky if you get a legal positivist um, who supported monarchy or something wild like that. You know. You'll never hear the point of view that these people are all pretending to be lawyers and jurists and law professors, and they, they are pretending that there's this rule of law that is sanctimonious and so on and so forth. This is all politics. Our side has been saying that for over 100 years now. And now, this Supreme Court is so radical right... I mean, that uh, it's, it's completely changed the game. And to call that radical right is just amazing. To say, not, you know, there's no constitutional right to abortion, but actually this is a state issue. Um, we abrogated that right here at the United States Supreme Court. We should never have even passed Roe v. Wade. We should never have, have allowed that to go forward. We're just going to overturn that and send it back to the states. That's all the opinion said. In my opinion, it should have gone a lot harder. But, I mean, that was as milk toast and easy as it gets, saying, no, this isn't a federal issue. This is a state prerogative. To call that radical right is kind of surreal. To say that... Um, you know, the June 2022 Supreme Court decision in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, which found a Second Amendment right to carry a handgun for self-defense outside the home, that that is radical right-wing extremism in the Supreme Court is just incredible. Because until the Clinton administration in the 90s, that was America. These leftists have been so in control and so out of control, on the other hand, for so long that it's like the world is ending to them. To have not even right-wing opinions, but just sane assessments of the Constitution. Chemerinsky, I'm pretty sure, wrote my con law book when I was in law school. Speaking of which, so Abramson continues... I started this semester with Marbury v. Madison, as almost all of us do. That was a famous case decided in, in the very beginning of the Republic uh, about federal power and um, judicial review, that is, judicial review of, of uh, laws passed by Congress, right, which we take for granted now. So Abramson is saying, I start the semester like that, which everybody does. I traditionally played devil's advocate with judicial review. I didn't have to. Before I got... 20 sentences out of my mouth. The students were already asking whether judicial review, both historically and today, serves any democratic purpose. That's where law students are now. Not because they're right-wing maniacs like us, but because they are leftists. What a remarkable point in history we're at right now. For all this time, Liberals have been pretending this is all about law. This is all about law. This is all about law. Like when Woodrow Wilson wants to wage a war that will end all wars, go interfere in Europe, create a League of Nations. This is all legal. This has nothing to actually do with war. This certainly isn't political. We're going to create this legal regime. The rule of law will govern the affairs of men, not war. Not politics, but law. We have had that lie ever since Woodrow Wilson. Really before that, but in America, it really was Woodrow Wilson. I would highly recommend something from the Marine Corps' reading list, the Commandant's reading list, uh, Henry Kissinger's book, Diplomacy. 
I've plugged it here on this program before, but it's an amazing analysis. I don't care what you think about Kissinger. Brilliant guy. I mean, one of a kind. You've got to read the book Diplomacy. It's on Audible. You can listen to it. You don't have to read it. But he talks about that, about how America had this myth ever since Wilson, this myth that everything we do, that, that is American liberals, because that's what American means, is liberal. Everything we do is about the law. This isn't politics. We're not bickering back and forth between tribal groups, you know, contending over resources. This is all about law, the rule of law. As an abstract concept, no man is above it. We're all treated equally as a legal concept. We did the same thing with Nuremberg. So after Wilson and World War I, we don't join League of Nations. We got a second shot. Because then came World War II. So we make this entire legal system out of World War II. Legal system, mind you. Not political. Totally not political at all that Germany is not in the UN Security Council, right? Not political at all that it was the victors of, the, of World War II plus China, you know, to counterbalance people and to keep Japan in check. Not political at all. Totally legal. Kind of like this podcast. Not political at all. It's all legal, right? We Americans have had that lie forever. At least the last hundred plus years. Everything's legal. Nothing's political. And now, because of Trump's appointees and the new constitution of the Supreme Court... My God, liberals are finally realizing what we've been saying the entire time. Abramson, that is the guy who was just talking about all this, judicial review and, you know, we're on the cusp of disaster and we can't even teach constitutional law as law anymore. Abramson also has students read a Franz Kafka story about a man from the country who finds a gatekeeper who won't allow him to gain entry into the law. Quote, it's a long story about whether there is a law inside that the doorkeeper is keeping students from getting into, or whether there is nothing in there, that it's all a charade, it's all a magic trick. There are only doorkeepers and doorkeepers and doorkeepers, end quote. In the past, students believed in the law and thought that there was a difference between the law and its agents who could be faithful or corrupt, Abramson said. But now his students share this vast cynicism that they are only gatekeepers, and there is no such thing as the law. The liberal law students have just taken the red pill, everybody. It's the red pill I took in law school. Welcome aboard, you lefties. It's amazing that uh, Abramson would point out Kafka, because I said the same thing about the legal system the whole time that I was entangled in South Carolina's nonsense. It was Kafka-esque. It was a nightmare. A nightmare. There are no laws. It is all corrupt. There is only abuse of discretion. The, the insane people are running the madhouse. Everything's upside down. It's a different animal when you are the inmate, when you are the defendant. It's crazy enough just being a lawyer in this system. But when it's all coming down on you and you know how everything is supposed to work and it does not work, that is a real eye-opening moment. So I'm glad all these law students and the law professors, mind you, are all getting this lesson in a much gentler way than I did. Will Baud, now this is the interesting thing about this ABA article, it actually is going to give you the other side for once. It's a mere, you know, six sentences or something, but at least they're going to do you this favor. Will Baud, a professor at the University of Chicago Law School, offers a different perspective at the Volokh conspiracy. There is a perception that teaching constitutional law is more difficult because the Supreme Court has been doing so many things so quickly. But the perception is wrong, Baud said. 
The Supreme Court has long been engaging in awe-inspiring power grabs, he said, citing cases with liberal results on abortion, same-sex marriage, desegregation, and the rights of criminal defendants. I guess I forgot that one. Well, we actually did talk about abortion, same-sex marriage, desegregation, all of those watershed liberal opinions from the Supreme Court. Rights of criminal defendants, I actually obviously agree with those, having been a criminal defendant and being a criminal defense uh, lawyer, but they're obviously liberal decisions. Quote, the court has always been making questionable calls in high-profile cases, likely for a mix of political reasons and genuine differences of opinion about the nature of the Constitution, end quote. Quote, what has really changed is not that the court is newly imperial or newly lawless or newly political. What has changed is that many more folks inside the ivory tower have noticed and no longer see their values and ways of thinking by the court. Ah, couldn't have said it better myself. It's not that things have changed. It's not that law is no longer law. Now it's all politics. It's that liberals are finally noticing that fact because it's not going their way at this particular moment in time. And that's not to say it won't swing back the other way. Who knows? I mean, somebody could come and assassinate the whole supermajority and Biden elects all the justices in his last hours as president. You know, come, I don't know, next month. Who knows? Anything could happen. Fifteen forty. How did that happen? We haven't even breached the rise above movement case. Let's see the uh, comments here. Hopefully, the audio has been working this whole time. Didn't even check that. Everyone's saying good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Constitution for the United States, or the Constitution of the United States? Hmm. Who's in charge of the blacklist? <laughs> yeah, well, there's no real, you know, head of an entity. Um, the legal profession, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's democratic. It's very cliquish. Um, you know, the Florida Bar, to its credit, uh, does a good job, I think, of discerning what's an actual violation and what's not. Um, but I'm not talking about that kind of blacklist. I'm talking about like a social blacklist. Here's a, an illustration. There's a movie called Conspiracy. Maybe it's Conspirator. I don't know. Let's check it out real time. Movie uh, Conspiracy. Uh, who's the guy that plays Professor X? I don't know. I don't know these people's names. Anyway, he was a lawyer. It was conspiracy. No, it's not. Stanley Tucci? No. No, it is not conspiracy. Don't look at that one. <laughs> so, the guy that plays Professor X, in this movie, he is a lawyer. He is a military lawyer. James McAvoy. It's the conspirator. Came out in 2010. Okay. Now we're on the ball here. Con the conspirator. Had Robin Wright. I think she was the woman. Um, you know, Frank Underwood's wife. She was the woman being prosecuted. James McAvoy was a military lawyer who um, wanted nothing to do with this woman. The Southerners were traitors. Uh, you know, these people tried, they did, they assassinated the president, President Lincoln. And he's got to defend this woman who's defending these terrorists. You know, and then as he gets into the case and he discovers actually this woman is innocent. Her son might be a scumbag, but this woman is innocent. And by the way, the government is out of control. And they're doing all these illegal things. They're bringing in witnesses who are bold-faced lying on the stand. He sees all this corruption going on by the military and the federal government that he loves. And he starts calling it out. Huge career mistake. So to get back to Sir, Sir Micro's uh, question here, who's in charge of the blacklist, that movie is a powerful inter uh, illustration of what happens when you go against the legal system as a lawyer. I'm not even going to tell you. I'm just, you got to watch The Conspirator. It's just, it's an excellent movie. I will point out that movie would never be made today. 
Uh, you, you're essentially sympathizing with the Confederate cause against the federal government when you watch that movie. Kind of like John Carter of Mars was made by Disney when my kids were little. They would never make that today because John Carter was a Confederate officer. And they even say that in the movie. He's a ca Confederate cavalry officer from, uh, from Virginia. You couldn't get away with that today. Kind of like the conspirator, the only reason they got away with that movie, in my humble opinion, is that at the time, the liberals were all up in arms about Guantanamo and the war on terror and everything the Bush administration had done, uh, which, you know, I'm not arguing against. I'm just saying the liberal establishment would greenlight a movie like that because they're trying to get all these white Christian Southerners to look at this and say, Remember when the federal government was out of control against you? This is how corrupt the federal government is. This is how out of control they can be when it's a time of war. So The Conspirator is an awesome movie I will preach till I die. White Student Transmission says, Didn't constitutional law get put off balance when they changed over to case law? So they can incrementally nudge left each case. Going to give you a little pushback on that one, white student transmission, because case law has always been the way that things have been done in America. That's the common law that came from England. So when William of Normandy invaded England, conquered England, and you had these Norman rulers, these outsiders, these Frenchies uh, ruling England, what they did was obviously every conqueror is going to impose their own legal system, but they also kept the common law. They kept all of the local customs, uh, the way things had been done before the Normans came and took over. So, for instance, um, you know, if you and a neighbor were in a dispute and the neighbor killed your pig, and pigs, I, I know nothing of English money, certainly not medieval English money, so don't hold me to this, but if they found out that your pig was worth, uh, you know, in this trial, you had a whole trial over... Um, this killed pig and the judge said you're going to pay your neighbor one shilling for the pig you killed well the next time two neighbors had a dispute in this neighborhood and came forward and the guy said he killed my pig the judge is going to say he's not going to be like well I don't know do, do I charge him a, a farthing a, a crown a shilling ten shillings what do I do they look at the previous case and they say well in that case um, the, the plaintiff was ordered, I'm sorry, the defendant was ordered to pay uh, one shilling for the pig. So that's what you're going to do. We're going to order that you pay one shilling for the pig. That's what we mean by the common law. The local law um, controls. So you look at those previous cases, that's what we mean by case law. You look at the previous cases and you determine, you know, what's different about this case before the bar. What's the same about this case before the bar? You know, are these plaintiffs similarly situated? Uh, were they harmed in the same way? Uh, we look at all those factors and the judge comes up with a decision, right? However, you are correct. That is exactly how they moved everything to the left. That and, you know, their own novel interpretation of what law means and um, the 14th Amendment and the 13th Amendment and, uh, you know, women's suffrage and all these societal values that they're like, well, you know, that doesn't really mean that anymore. And we're moving towards this uh, new inclusive world. And, you know, so they bring their own personal prejudices in there and they legalize it up to justify whatever outcome they want. So, yeah, it's been going on like that for a long, 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 long time, since before any of us were born. But it's not case law that's to blame for that. That's always been our system of law. Uh, what happened to your Facebook account, asks the Vestro. No idea. No idea. I, uh, I deleted it, I'll tell you that. And then I was talked into uh, undeleting it because I've got to run ads. I was talking to a fellow business owner. He's not a lawyer, but... Um, a friend of mine who said, dude, if you're shutting down Facebook that has X amount of users, then you've got to run ads on there. So I undeleted it. However, I'm obviously not running ads on there. And I would give a little pushback on that because I did run an ad on Twitter. I've, I've run an ad on Twitter before, and it was 
I mean, successful by whatever metric you're going to say it's successful, it, it worked, right? Like it, things happened. Like it, it had a bigger reach. People clicked on things. But I ran a test ad since they removed my blue check mark. I paid for an ad on just a tweet that I had made just as a test. And sure enough, all the money was spent, but zero post engagement, zero reach, all of the um, likes and reposts and comments, they were all organic. That money just was burned. Twitter has effectively blacklisted me silently from advertising. So I'm certain that the same thing is true of Facebook. But to answer your question, it's there. You know, I have a Facebook. I just, I hate Facebook with every fiber of my being. I hate social media. But I have it because I have a business and you have to because this is America. Uh, hey, Ulfric, what's on the agenda today? Good question. We were talking about constitutional law professors and the changes in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the Rise Above Movement case uh, and a couple other things. Also, for those of you late to class, I will be on Chris Cantwell's show, The Radical Agenda, on Monday. So, let's talk about Rise Above Movement with the 10 minutes we have left. Also, uh, Ulfric, I said everybody should watch the movie The Conspirator with James McAvoy and Robin Wright from 2010. All right, let's go to the CMECF. Today is the day that uh, being a lawyer actually is going to help this program. <laughs> So, if you didn't see last week's episode, we talked about the Rise Above Movement case, which I'm going to talk about in depth on Cantwell's program on Monday. But I gave a background of the case, um, said everything that was happening at that moment, last Thursday, I'm doing this program today on Wednesday because I got court out of county tomorrow at this time. Um, so we're doing it a little early this week, but I had talked about at that particular moment on Thursday last week, the judge had ordered Rob Rundo to be released. He had dismissed the case against Rundo, saying the DOJ, the Department of Justice, the feds, had engaged in selective prosecution because they went after the Rise Above movement, targeted all these guys, for fighting at rallies, did not charge a single Antifa member, right? Obviously, obviously. We've been saying that for years. So the judge said, no, you did all this. You never prosecuted Antifa. It's obvious the DOJ is coming down on one side of this fight and not the other. I'm ordering him released. This case is dismissed. The Department of Justice, <clears throat> the assistant United States attorneys, they said, well, hold on, we want you to stay his release. Just hold him until we can appeal. We're going to file an emergency appeal because we think your order is wrong. We think it's wrong for you to dismiss this case. We're going to appeal immediately to the appellate court. Stay his release, keep him here until we can get to the appellate court. And the judge said, no, I'm not doing that. I don't think it's right for Rob Rondo to spend another minute in jail. Ordered him back to the jails to be booked out, and that's what happened. They booked him out. They processed him out. He got out. Gone. Poof. That was last Wednesday. Within minutes, the DOJ had filed an emergency appeal asking the appellate court to stay the order and keep Rob Rondo in jail pending the appeal. Didn't mention in this emergency appeal to the appellate court that Rundo had already been released. Total. I have nothing nice to say about it. That's where we were last Thursday. Within hours, tops, of that broadcast, his defense attorney was talking with the DOJ negotiating Rundo's um, self-surrender, which means he's going to turn himself in, right? DOJ says, okay, that's fine. You do this, that, and the other, whatever. And we're going to talk about another case, two other cases, where they've done largely the same thing. They said, all right, you turn him in, blah, blah, blah. 
And I talked about this when we were doing one of the co-defendants cases back when this first happened and the DOJ threatened me. Uh, well, threat, technically threatened uh, the co-defendant saying, yeah, I'd, basically I'd hate for one of these sheriffs knowing that he's wanted to, you know, not know that you're turning him in. I mean, he could get shot. Unbelievable. So they made this fake deal with Rundo's lawyer and then while they're on the phone or immediately after they hang up, they arrest Rundo on the street. They've been watching him following the whole time. Clown shoes. No charges, by the way. No charges pending. The uh, appellate court did come back and say, stay that order, hold him there. But there's no arrest warrant, right? There are no charges. They said stay the order and keep him there. They didn't know he had already been released. So these people arrested Rundo on that nonsense. No authority or justification whatsoever. He gets taken back to the court, and the judge is just outraged, beside himself. I wish I was there at that hearing. But he's saying all of these things. You know, you people picked him up with no arrest warrant, no uh, charges against him. The appellate court opinion does not authorize you to do this, but. What am I supposed to do? So he holds a, a hearing. He, he sets a hearing for Monday. That is two days ago. <clears throat> and he issues, uh, well, he ordered them to bring in the transcript so he could see what exactly was said at these hearings, so on and so forth. So they hold this hearing Monday, and they, he issues this order, which, of course, the DOJ immediately appealed. But this was filed on Monday. And then, I guess the DOJ did wait until yesterday to file this, so they didn't do it within minutes like the last time. But here's the order releasing Robert Rundo. And I'm going to give you the spoil alert so you're not on this emotional roller coaster like the rest of us. The TLDR here is the judge again ordered that Rundo be released because there is no authority to hold him. Um... However, he is staying the order, waiting for guidance from the appellate court. So that's, I'm going to give you the spoiler alert so you're not, you know, sitting there with bated breath wondering what's going to happen. Like, that, that is what happened. So let's get into, wow, man, there's 11 pages in this, and um, it's already time to go. Now before the court is Robert Rundo's oral request for an arraignment or some type of process to challenge his unlawful rearrest and detention. So right off the bat. The judge is saying, this arrest, this rearrest and detention is 100% illegal. The parties are familiar with the facts of this case, and so were all of you if you were here last week. At the hearing in which the court dismissed the first superseding indictment and ordered Mr. Rundle released forthwith, the government requested that the court stay its order pending appeal and keep Mr. Rundo detained. The court denied the government's request because the court believes Mr. Rundo was unconstitutionally prosecuted. And, quote, it would run completely afoul of the Constitution for the court to order that a person sit in jail because at some unknown point in the future, an appellate court might reverse the court order that dropped the charges, end quote. The court ordered Mr. Rundo released forthwith and issued a judgment of discharge. The government appealed to the Ninth Circuit minutes after the court's order. So, you might be getting the picture that this is unprecedented. This is a constitutional crisis that is unfolding before your eyes, all centering on our friend, Rob Rundo. I was telling a, a mutual friend uh, just this morning, like this reminds me of Ex parte Milligan, which is another fascinating case that no one knows about. Another uh, first year constitutional law case. Milligan was arrested in the middle of the night by soldiers. I believe he was sentenced to death. Um, appeal to the Supreme Court. This was in the uh, Civil War. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. You can't hold this civilian uh, on, you can't put him on trial in a military court. The, the civil courts were open. That's where he should have been tried. We're dismissing this case. And he just walked free. And it seems like, well, obviously, um, that was the right decision. Like, you know, 
he's a civilian, there were civil courts open, you should have tried him there. So you're required to learn that now, not just because of the history of the law, but because, you know, after when I went to law school, it was after 9-11. Like, you've got to know Guantanamo is illegal and all these detentions are illegal, and that's where it all... Again, like the conspirator, look at what they did to the Southerners. What they don't tell you in law school or anywhere else, Milligan is a fascinating character. Um, he was a lawyer. Let's start with that. He was a lawyer in Indiana, which is where he was arrested, in the middle of the night, dragged out of his home by soldiers. He sympathized with the Southern cause. Uh, he was accused of being part of a group that was, you know, not just vocally supporting the Southerners and the Southern cause, but apparently providing material support to the Southerners. And even then, the Supreme Court is like, no, you, you can't do that. He's a civilian. You got to put him in the civilian court system, right? That kind of constitutional crisis where the federal government is just like, this is a war. We're doing what we can with what we've got. That's the mindset. That is what this case reminds me of. Totally unprecedented. This is 100% illegal. Everybody knows it. But the feds believe they are at war with white supremacists, especially, quote unquote, combat ready white supremacists like Rob Rondo and the Rise Above movement. So all the, the rules, the Constitution, the, the laws, the case precedents of this country, they're all out the window. Fuck them. Because we've got to get this guy. He cannot be allowed on the streets. He certainly can't lead the country. We've got to appeal this. And we've got to get some liberal judge to overturn this dismissal. So by any means necessary, get him back in jail and hold him there. Doesn't matter if he's got charges. Doesn't matter the legality of it. Get him in jail and put this judge on the spot. That is what's going on. Where is the media talking about this case? Interestingly, another case in the Central District of California, the Los Angeles courthouse, where this farce is going on right now, they had another guy whose name I completely forget, uh, Israeli citizen, was an informant, um, went the wrong way against uh, the Biden administration, apparently a Russian national. Biden administration wants his head, right? Las Vegas uh, judge said, look, I mean, he might be a flight risk, but he's not a danger to society, and the government's not showing me why I can't let him out and put an ankle monitor on him. Like, plus, if he's an informant and informing against Russians to America, like he's not going to be popular in Russia. Russia is not going to take him. Are you kidding? He's not, fly he's not fleeing to Russia. And so the judge in Las Vegas let him go. So the DOJ does to this... Smirnov, that's his name. How could you forget that? So the judge lets Smirnov go. Smirnov travels apparently to L.A., which is where his uh, lawyers are. <laughs> he's meeting with his lawyers meeting with his defense lawyers, and the DOJ has him arrested at his lawyer's office. The same week that this is happening to Rob Rundo. Is that incredible or what? Um, that guy did not have the same luck with a judge. That guy got Otis Wright, who, in, I mean, no disrespect to Otis Wright. That guy is a... A serious guy. Marine Corps, Vietnam veteran. Um, that's a serious dude. Completely disagree with him legally, but I am not saying a word against that guy. Um, Carney is Rundo's judge. Carney, as the DOJ knows, because the liberal media won't shut up about it, is already under fire from the appellate court, the liberal appellate court, mind you, uh, that overturned him on, on the Rundo case. He had already dismissed this case. Rundo's case has been dismissed twice now. And the first time was because the Anti-Riot Act was unconstitutional. Appellate court said, no, it's not. <laughs> you charge him. Go ahead and re-indict him. And so they did. Completely different case. I don't remember what it is, but he defied the appellate court, you know, in the liberals' eyes. Uh, had to testify to it, the whole nine yards. And so now... 
They've got him. They're like, he's not going to defy the Ninth, the, the ninth Circuit again. He's not going to defy the appellate court again. He's already under fire for this other completely unrelated case. So we're going to do whatever we want to do, and he's not going to do a thing about it, politically speaking. Here's another X factor in the case. He's retiring in May. And from what I heard, um, I, didn't check, I didn't check Pacer for this. Uh, stipulation, the court hearing... I don't see it on here. I don't know where my friend uh, saw this, but he's telling me that they're not giving him a hearing until June. I can't confirm that, but if that's true, it's amazing that he's getting a hearing in June because this judge is retiring in May. And will there be another judge who will do the right thing? So, before the Ninth Circuit, the government filed an emergency request. This is back to Carney's opinion here, where he is, his order, excuse me, where he is releasing Rundo. Before the Ninth Circuit, the government filed an emergency request to stay the court's release order pending appeal. The next day, on February 22nd, that is last Thursday, the Ninth Circuit issued an order that stated in full, you know, district court's judgment uh, is temporarily stayed, okay, we we talked about that. The appellate court said, no, stay that order, keep him in jail, right? Um, in the case cited by the appellate court, <clears throat> the Ninth Circuit explained that a temporary stay in this context, sometimes referred to as an administrative stay, is only intended to preserve the status quo until the substantive motion for a stay pending appeal can be considered on the merits and does not constitute in any way a decision as to the merits of the motion for stay pending, uh, pending the appeal. That's quoted from the appellate court itself. This is to preserve the status quo. The status quo, according to the appellate court at that time, last Thursday, was keep Rundo in jail. They didn't know he was already released is to preserve the status quo. So if he's already out on the street, then it's the appellate court's decision that, well, that's out the window now. Now you're not preserving the status quo. You're putting him back in jail. You're rearresting him. That's not the status quo. So back to the judge's opinion, uh, order, excuse me. But before the Ninth Circuit issued its order temporarily staying this court's judgment of discharge, Mr. Rundo had already been released. And that's the judge's emphasis, not mine, had already been released. Thus, the status quo at the time of the Ninth Circuit's order was that Mr. Rundle was not detained, and the Ninth Circuit's order was moot. That's the judge's word. I would challenge you to find any lawyer in this country who would disagree with that. You would have to go through some serious legal gymnastics, and yet the DOJ lawyers ordered it anyway. Because the FBI is not going to go arrest somebody off the street without the DOJ approving it first. Those lawyers approved what they did. I guarantee you. The FBI agents were just rogue agents prowling the streets looking for Rundo with no word from above. The DOJ lawyers told them to do it. I would bet my law license on it. According to, back to the order here, according to the Deputy Federal Public Defender, the government did not inform the Ninth Circuit that the status quo had changed, despite knowing that Mr. Rundo had been released either before or shortly after the Ninth Circuit issued its administrative stay. So, I was actually, I, I filled out a survey just this morning from the London School of Economics, and they were asking about Florida law and uh, the legal profession and the practice of law here, and they were, they were pointing out there's an ethical rule uh, in the Florida Bar Rules, saying if you find out something, you know, contrary to your, def your client or whatever, in this case, the DOG's, DOJ's client is the United States government, if you find that out, you have to disclose it, even if it's after the fact. Uh, that's federal too, man. Federal law require, the rule, court, rules of court require, you have got to tell the judge. You, you've got a, a, a duty of candor to the tribunal. You have to tell the appellate court. Actually, Rundo's already been released. Um, the game has changed since we filed this emergency repeal. He's already been released. They had a duty to tell the appellate court that. 
and they know full well. Every lawyer knows that. To continue, even though Mr. Rundo had already been released, the government applied to the magistrate judge on duty, Magistrate Judge Steve Kim, ex parte, under seal, for the issuance of an arrest warrant based on the Ninth Circuit's administrative stay on, of his release, a release which had already taken place. So this is the f just amazing thing that the DOJ has done here. Ex parte under seal. Let's talk about that. Ex parte means that they did it on their own without informing defense counsel. Ex parte means it's of this one side. Like typically you have to inform the other side when you're doing something. You know, I can't file something with the court and not give it to opposing counsel. Whether it's criminal law, family law, civil law, I can't just file things, give it to the judge and say, hey judge, can you rule on this and not tell the other side what I'm doing? Duh, unless it's an emergency. You know, if, um, for instance, if I'm asking uh, for a, an injunction for a client of mine who thinks they're gonna be killed or something like that, you know, I, you can't inform the other side that is the potential murderer, you know. You, okay, that's the kind of context you're talking about ex parte uh, judgments. Like, I can't even write to the judicial assistant and say, hey, can I, can I talk to you about scheduling this hearing unless I've got the other side on the phone with me or I've got them CC'd in an email. You don't just talk to the judge on your own. That is ex parte. It is legal in certain contexts, but that is what the DOJ did here. Went ex parte to the magistrate judge on duty, magistrate judge Steve Kim, under seal, ex parte under seal means you can't even see this. We're talking Soviet Union style. You are not allowed to know what we are asking of the judge. You're not allowed to know what we're doing here, what we're saying to him, nothing. So they actually had to file to unseal all of this stuff in Rundo's case so that Judge Carney could see what the heck the DOJ even did. So they went ex parte under seal to the magistrate on duty asking for an arrest warrant. The government cited no law in support of its application. Instead, it stated that, quote, in light of the Ninth Circuit stay, the August 2nd, 2023 detention order of Defendant Rundo is the operative order now in effect, end quote. The government went on to mischaracterize the Ninth Circuit order as a, quote, stay of the court's dismissal order, end quote. Notably, the Ninth Circuit did not stay this court's dismissal of the first superseding indictment. It stayed only the judgment of discharge. In other words, the appellate court didn't say that the judge, uh, his order dismissing the case was overturned or reversed or stayed or anything of the sort. There are still no charges against Rundo. That indictment was dismissed. It is still dismissed. The appellate court has not reinstated that indictment. He is in jail with no indictment. And as the judge said earlier, the appellate court is just saying, let's keep the status quo. It's not saying that there's any merit whatsoever to what the government has done. There's no, no merit whatsoever to the government appealing the dismissal of the indictment. They're not saying that. They're just saying maintain the status quo. And what the government has done is they went and they lied. They didn't, they lied by omission to the appellate court. And then they lied just brass balls out lied to the magistrate judge to get an arrest warrant. And the judge, the district court judge, Carney, is calling out the government attorneys for all the totally illegal stuff they have done. After a Zoom hearing, Magistrate Judge Kim issued a warrant for Mr. Rundo's arrest. As everyone recognizes, the circumstances were complicated. Magistrate Judge Kim later explained that despite a lack of briefing from the government, he believed he had authority to issue an arrest warrant based on the federal rules of criminal procedure under Rule 4, the All Writs Act, the Bail Reform Act, and his inherent authority to allow him to administer process and give effect to what the Ninth Circuit was trying to do. What a fascinating statement. And that, quote, some combination of those things allowed him to issue an arrest warrant as a mechanism to try to restore status quo, end quote. Wow. These people are running the ship. These people are steering the ship right now. The entire legal profession is looking to people like Magistrate Judge Kim. And he's going to say some things like that which I'll get into. Let's finish this paragraph before I break that down.
The warrant stated that the U.S. Marshal was to bring Mr. Rundo to the nearest magistrate judge to answer an indictment charging him with conspiracy and riots in violation of Title 18 United States Code Sections 371 to 101. In other words, Magistrate Judge Kim issued an arrest warrant based on the first superseding indictment, which this court had dismissed one day earlier. According to the Deputy Federal Public Defender, Magistrate Judge Kim issued the warrant in part based on the government's representation that Mr. Runda would receive some process, such as the ability to challenge his detention. But after receiving the arrest warrant and using that to arrest Mr. Rundo, the government then went back to the Ninth Circuit and requested an order that would deny Mr. Rundo that process. In response to that request, the Ninth Circuit issued a further order acknowledging that Mr. Rundo had been arrested and stating that Rundo is to remain in custody pending resolution of the appellant's motion to stay released pending appeal. No, this is a quote from the appellate court, no lower court may order his release absent further order of this court, end quote. What a travesty, a total plague on the judicial system that the DOJ has perpetrated here. So let's look to Magistrate Judge Kim's uh, analysis of why he thought he could issue this arrest warrant. First of all, as District Court Judge uh, Carney is pointing out, he's basing this on the first indictment, the first superseding indictment, which had already been dismissed. So right off the bat, if that's your reasoning, you're out of here. No, you can't issue an arrest warrant based on charges that have been dismissed already. That's obviously backwards and insane. So how Magistrate Judge Kim is going to justify this is this amazing thing. He, issued, he had the authority to issue the arrest warrant based on, quote, the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure under Rule 4, that's one thing. The All Writs Act, that's number two. Number three, the Bail Reform Act. And number four, his uh, inherent authority to allow him to administer process and give effect to what the Ninth Circuit was trying to do. And that, quote, some combination of those four things allowed him to issue an arrest warrant as, an, as a mechanism to try and restore status quo, end quote. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you have to be a lawyer to understand how insane that is. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Um, I've said several times on this program, my dad was a lawyer. Uh, I was raised during the Cold War, the tail end of the Cold War. And I would always be told the difference between American law and Soviet law is that if it's not proscribed, if it's not, you know, specifically and explicitly illegal, then you're allowed to do it in America. Soviet law has this system where they compare things and, well, you should have known this and we're going to interpret it this way and you should have known it was illegal and, you know, I have this authority to do this and that because of these laws and it's this, this muddy thing where you're empowering the government to interpret things that aren't actually illegal, but now they are because, screw you, you're on the wrong side, you're not in the party and you have offended the government. That was always the difference between American law and Soviet law. What is amazing about Magistrate Judge Kim's analysis here is that he had absolutely no authority to issue this arrest warrant. There were no charges against Rundo, and the judges do not have some inherent authority to just arrest people to restore a status quo by the Ninth Circuit, which has no authority to order his arrest to restore a status quo that the government you know, wanted, that, but that is already gone. This entire thing is so mad. And the judge, def the magistrate judge defending himself for, for doing this absolutely mad thing is, uh, it's crazy to watch as a lawyer. But as we said uh, earlier in the first part of this program, talking about con law professors, you know, flipping out about the U.S. Supreme Court's opinions, uh, it's kind of always been like this, Right? These liberal judges will just power grab and make things up to justify whatever thing they're trying to do. 
that's what law has been for a long, 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 long time. Like, like uh, the guy said, Abramson, you know, he always starts with Marbury v. Madison. Like, look at the early opinions of the U.S. Supreme Court. They're total madness. They were literally just making crap up. Uh, they were making things up and writing these opinions that we now all accept as, you know, divine revelation and absolutely concrete reality. Like, they just made crap up in the early Supreme Court. Like, well, you know, it doesn't really make sense for states to be allowed to regulate migration of birds in their own territories because birds travel everywhere. So really, that's a federal government prerogative. Yeah, we're going to get rid of this law in, in Missouri or whatever, wherever that case was. We're going to get rid of this Missouri law. Um, it's now a federal prerogative to regulate the mig migration of birds. That is how just Wild West it was in the early Supreme Court. And John Jay made the Supreme Court what it is. Judicial review, uh, federal prerogatives, all the, all the constitutional law principles we take for granted now, they were just plain made up in the early days of the Republic. No one wants to talk about that. So when you see someone like Magistrate Judge Kim saying insane things like this, like, yeah, it's surreal and it's frustrating and it's crazy, but this is how judges always act, you know, in a lot of cases at every level, every level of the judiciary. Hence the title of this program, Judicial Bedlam. So one of the things um, that I want to point out before I forget is that Carney is staying his order because he believes in the rule of law. He said that in the status hearing last week. He says, I have, I'm of a mind, I'm of a mind right now to release Rundo, but the Ninth Circuit has said this, which we quoted just now, no lower court may order his release absent further order of this court. Um, I'm of a mind to release Rundo right now, but because I believe in the rule of law, I'm going to order his release, stay the order, and await guidance from the Ninth Circuit. In my opinion, this is so beyond outrageous what the government has done that I feel like the Ninth Circuit has to come back in Rundo's favor. There are times where, you know, the courts and, and the government, they just don't care. They're like, you know, if you don't like it, revolt, and we'll put you in prison or hang you. Like, this is the way it's going to be. That does happen sometimes, but this is so manifestly bold-faced illegal. I feel like the Ninth Circuit has to come back in Rundo's favor. They have to point out, this is totally illegal. There was no authority for this. You have to release him now. Um, something has got to happen. Like, the Ninth Circuit is just going to be reaffirming total illegitimacy and saying we are beyond law now if they approve what the DOJ has done. To continue with the judge's order, apparently in response to the government's request to the Ninth Circuit for an order that would deny Mr. Rundo any process to contest its attention, Magistrate Judge Kim held a second hearing with the government and Mr. Rundo's counsel this time. So this time they invited the defense counsel. That was nice of them. At a hearing later the same day before this court, the deputy federal public defender represented the magist that Magistrate Judge Kim felt that the government had misled him when it represented Mr. Rundo would have the ability to challenge his detention. So, it's another reason to believe that the Ninth Circuit is going to come back in favor of Rundo. Because it's one thing for Magistrate Judge Kim to say, well, I had all these inherent uh, powers and authorities and this act and that act, and I was trying to restore the status quo, which is an, it's an insane thing to say. But even defending himself, he still says, also, the United States government misled me. They lied to me when they sought this arrest warrant. If even that guy is saying the DOJ did something illegal here, I feel like the Ninth Circuit has got to come back for Rundo. Fortunately, Magistrate Judge Kim had transcripts from the hearings before him made available for this court. 
That is Carney's court. If anything, the deputy federal public defender's representation underrepresented Magistrate Judge Kim's findings. At the second hearing, Magistrate Judge Kim laid out his grave concerns with how the United States Attorney's Office conducted itself after this court ordered Mr. Rundo released. So, the federal magistrate judge, Judge Kim, says, I've got all these inherent authority powers and this, that, and the other, and I'm going to restore the status quo and totally illegal, defending himself. However, when he finds out what the DOJ did, well, holy hell. So Judge Carney is pointing out the PD, Rundo's lawyer, actually understated this whole thing. So Judge Kim, she's saying, well, he, he you know, said that this was a, a misrepresentation and they said this, that, and the other. But Judge Carney is like, it was way worse than that. Judge Kim went off on the government. He was talking about his grave concerns with how the United States Attorney's Office conducted itself after this court ordered Mr. Rundo released. At this time, a final transcript is not available on the docket, but the parties have provided the court with a preliminary transcript. Per that transcript, Magistrate Judge Kim was uncomfortable with the government's shifting positions and lack of legal authority to justify its request. Magistrate Judge Kim was also troubled by how the government went about seeking an arrest warrant, treating it as a, quote, routine duty matter, rather than the extraordinary request that it was, and doing it ex parte without the involvement of Mr. Rundo's counsel. Most shocking or what Magistrate Judge Kim describes as, quote, flat-out misrepresentations, which is as close as you can come in open court to calling a lawyer a liar. These misrepresentations, quote, range from at one end of the spectrum, they exude a level of condescension and contempt for the court, and at the other side of the spectrum, it actually shows an abuse of power, end quote, which is another reason to believe that the Ninth Circuit has to come back in favor of Rondo on this. Because even the magistrate judge, the magistrate judge, the district court judge, everybody is saying the DOJ lied, boldface lied, and abused power. Even the liberal Ninth Circuit can't turn the other way on this one, man. It is impossible to succinctly summarize Magistrate Judge Kim's position, but to put it simply... He was stunned by the government's the ends justify the means attitude, even though the difference between what we do in this country and what other countries do is we don't just arrest people because it seems like it's the right thing to do. These are Judge Kim's uh, words here. Judge Kim said, the difference between what we do in this country and what other countries do is we don't just arrest people because it seems like it's the right thing to do. There's a process through which we have to get that, and sometimes that might mean that it takes longer, end quote. At the conclusion of the hearing, Magistrate Judge Kim ordered the government to, quote, discuss the transcripts with the front office of the United States Attorney's Office, end quote. So, you have seen a total redemption arc for United States uh, Magistrate Judge Kim. Goes from this insane, like, I have all the power to do all these things and restore the status quo, to, whoa, what an abuse of power. You people straight out lied to me. You can't do this. And he is correcting the DOJ now. What a redemption. And all in the past 20 minutes. Later that day, this court held a status conference in response to Mr. Uh, Rundo's request for arraignment. That was Friday. At that hearing, Mr. Rundo explained that he wanted some kind of process that would uh, typically accompany an arrest. However, The court explained that it was not comfortable proceeding as requested because there are no pending charges or indictment. Further, the Ninth Circuit foreclosed any kind of relief related to his detention, meaning that this court could not even conduct a hearing pursuant to the Bail Reform Act. To my knowledge, that is completely unprecedented. I've never heard of anything like this, that an appellate court would order a man detained, I mean, Granted, the appellate court did not understand what the Department of Justice had done. They had no idea, all this background here. But for them to say, hold him, and no court is ever going to release him until we get a hold of this thing and the appeal. I mean, given these circumstances, I've never seen anything like this. And what Judge Carney is complaining about is 
this is totally illegal at every single level of government, and there's nothing he can do about it without defying the appellate court. To continue, the deputy federal public defender also expressly accused the government of engaging in prosecutorial misconduct with regards to its efforts to, re to re-arrest Mr. Rundo. Now, I talked about this uh, maybe in a veiled manner last week. Uh, I don't think I went all out on the record here. But I did mention, and I mentioned it earlier, that I was negotiating the surrender of one of the co-defendants, right? Uh, this is back in 2018 when this case first happened. And the DOJ lawyer was telling me, well, it'd be a shame if someone shot him because they didn't know you were coming out here to California to help turn him in. So you better hurry up. I'm not, I'm not lifting the arrest warrant. I'm not quashing the warrant. I'm, I'm not doing anything to help you. Just get out here and get him to Los Angeles now. Right? I've mentioned that part. What I didn't mention was going to find him in the desert, driving him all the way into Los Angeles, getting there, and these people at the DOJ who were waiting for us, who knew full well we were coming because I flew all the way from Florida to do this, we get there to the DOJ to surrender him and they would not allow me in the building to do it. Dick move. Okay, you know, whatever. I'm a Florida lawyer and everybody knows who I am, so I don't expect, uh, you know, much courtesy from these people. However, the outrageous part that happened next was the FBI drilling this guy not just, not just questioning him about the case, not just you know, completely violating his Sixth Amendment rights uh, and Fifth Amendment rights, interrogating him after they would not allow me in the building as his lawyer. No, no, no. No. They even talked him out of having me as his lawyer. It's like, you don't want that guy as your lawyer. That guy's going to get you jammed up. You got to fire him right now. That is, I mean, everything about that situation, arranging the self-surrender of this co-defendant was, again, like nothing I've ever seen. I mean, I have seen a lot of corruption, don't get me wrong. But the DOJ's actions and the FBI's actions in the Ram case is just, it's a, it's a case of its own. So whatever we're about to hear from the federal public defender for Robert Rundo, where she is expressly accusing the government of engaging in prosecutorial misconduct. I already know these people and I know she's telling the truth because I saw it firsthand. It happened to me and the co-defendant. So to go back to the order, the deputy federal public defender identified the following as the basis for the allegation of prosecutorial misconduct. One, while seeking an emergency stay, Oh no, I messed up. I pressed the wrong button. One, while seeking an emergency stay, the government did not update the Ninth Circuit that Mr. Rundo had been released, altering the status quo. Exactly. Like I said earlier, you have a duty of candor. You have a duty to update the court. You know, for instance, if it's a federal case, civil or criminal, I don't care. Um, you know, and they, they ask me, the opposing counsel asks me, um, you know, we're going to file this mo motion for enlargement of time, whatever it's going to be. And I'm on a yacht somewhere, you know, doing white supremacist stuff, whatever it is that I do. And I don't see the email, you know, till the next day. Well, by then they've already filed the motion and they, they say in the motion, we could not get a hold of defense counsel, right? Well, when I come back from my yachting activities with my rich white supremacist friends who rule the world, and I email them back and say, uh, sorry about that. I was doing whatever it is that I do. Um, we have no objection to this uh, continuance. That other lawyer has to write the court or file an admitted motion or something and say, okay, uh, we heard from defense counsel. He does not object to this motion. You have to update the court. That's a routine matter for everything you file. Obviously, you have to do it for something this bloody important. So that's just number one on the PD, on Rundo's uh, lawyer's list of why the DOJ engaged in prosecutorial misconduct. 
Number two, the government did not correct the record immediately after the Ninth Circuit issued an administrative stay based on a status quo that was no longer accurate. Right. Basically the same charge. Number three, the government then went to Magistrate Judge Kim ex parte and applied for an arrest warrant based on a moot administrative stay of release order that had already been effectuated. That is just mind-blowing. 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 That, to me, you should be disciplined by the bar for something that outrageous, which we've talked about. They went to the magistrate judge on duty ex parte, that means they didn't notify Rundo's lawyer, went to him, lied to him, didn't tell him this was moot because Rundo had already been released, didn't tell, I mean, just outright lied to him to secure an arrest warrant, which happens all the time. How Everybody knows it. Cops lie to judges all the time to get arrest warrants. Happens every single day in this country. But this, this is something special. Because this is all on record. I mean, it's not like you got to go to trial on this. There's, there's transcripts. The, everything that we file in federal court, right here at the top, <coughs> it has the date and the time that you file it. Like It has the page number, everything. I, you can't get away from, well, I didn't know. Uh, you know, this was filed before I, or after I, you know, asked for this arrest warrant ex parte. Like, there's no getting around this. There's receipts, man. They got receipts on everything in federal court and state court, at least here in Florida. Everything's electronic. You can't BS your way out of that one, man. It's, their arrogance in doing this is just incredible. So that's number three. Number four, the government did not inform the Ninth Circuit that Mr. Rundo, who was being monitored by law enforcement, was not actively attempting to flee the country. Uh, I will say I did not talk to Rundo personally. Don't try to pin that on me or him. But I will say, I know that's a fact. He was not trying to, to flee the country. He was in communication with his defense lawyer. They knew it. They knew it. Because they were following him the whole time. And they didn't tell the Ninth Circuit that. That happened to me here in Orlando. They were surveilling me for something that had absolutely nothing to do with me. Surveilling me for two full weeks. Knew everything I was doing, everywhere I was going. And to secure an arrest warrant for me, they lied to the judge saying that I was doing something illegal when they knew full well I was under surveillance the whole time. It was a bold faced lie. Like I said, cops do this every day in this country. Number five, despite its representations to Mr. Rundo and Magistrate Judge Kim, the government submitted a status report to the Ninth Circuit requesting that the Ninth Circuit issue an order providing no mechanism through which Mr. Rundo could challenge his detention. So, they were negotiating this self-surrender of Rundo with his attorney, saying, no, no, of course, well, yeah, of course he'll have due process and he can challenge his detention and try to, you know, get before a judge and get out of there. And they lied to the magistrate judge, saying, yeah, well, of course, we're going to, you know, allow him to challenge process and blah, blah, blah. But all the while, they were lying to everybody, because they were going to the Ninth Circuit and asking that he be detained without anybody being able to release him. That is prosecutorial misconduct. And Judge Carney is calling him out on it. So, again, there is no way, to my mind, unless we're going to just completely devolve into total anarchy, there is no way the Ninth Circuit is going to see what the DOJ has done here and allow this to stand. As indicated at the February 23rd, 2024 hearing, that is last uh, Friday, the court, like Magistrate Judge Kim, is troubled by the chain of events that led to Mr. Rundo's rearrest. In the court's experience, it is rare for the Federal Public Defender's Office to explicitly accuse the United States Attorney's Office of engaging in prosecutorial misconduct. Such an accusation is particularly troubling when it relates directly to, as this court found, selective prosecution. Wow. So the judge is pointing out, I dismissed this case because of selective prosecution. I dismissed this case because you people have a hard-on for Rundo and the Rise Above movement. You were prosecuting these people for their political ideology and not prosecuting Antifa and the leftists who have done the same or worse. So I'm dismissing this case. I dismissed this case for that reason, and now you have done all of this. 
Like, if you could be flayed alive by a judicial order, it would look like this. I've never seen an order this uh, brutal. But the court is also troubled by the conduct Magistrate Judge Kim described. To put it in Magistrate Judge Kim's words, the United States attorney must be above thinking that the end justifies any means. The United States attorney's office is not just another litigant. It wields an awesome power. It can deprive people of their liberty on behalf of the United States of America. In other words, a prosecutor is the representative not of an ordinary party to a controversy, but of a sovereignty whose obligation to govern impartially is as compelling as its obligation to govern at all, and whose interest, therefore, in a criminal prosecution is not that it shall win a case, but that justice shall be done. Amazingly, that case that they are quoting, United States v. Maloney, was also from the Ninth Circuit, but it was in 2014. That is how far we have fallen in 10 years' time. To think that people still talked like that just a mere 10 years ago, when we were all young, before we were veterans of the meme wars of 2016, 2017. Just 10 years ago, they were talking about the awesome power wielded by the United States of America and saying that it's not your job as a prosecutor for the government to win a case, but that justice shall be done. No one talks like that anymore. <laughs> it's get those white supremacists. That's the refrain now. Based on the transcripts of the hearings before Magistrate Judge Kim, the government failed to meet its solemn obligations. In general, Magistrate Judge Kim's words speak for themselves, and this court is not in a position to review the government's actions and determine whether its conduct was merely negligent or an intentional overstep. But the court is disappointed that the government's zeal to detain Mr. Rundo and its apparent frustration with the court's ruling led it to proceed in a manner less than befitting of the United States Attorney's Office. <laughs> like I said, if, if you can imagine someone being flayed alive by a court order, this is it. Like, le a manner less than befitting of the U.S. Attorney's Office. After he's agreed with the magistrate judge and the federal public defender that this is totally illegal and outrageous. Setting aside the accusation of prosecutorial misconduct, let's forget about that for a moment. The court is obligated to address Mr. Rundo's request for an arraignment or other process related to his present detention. In other words, what is so outrageous about what the DOJ has done? What's so outrageous about what they've done with the Ninth Circuit, abusing their power by going to the Ninth Circuit, is that they've asked that Rundo be held and have absolutely no way to get out of jail. There is nothing he can do. An arraignment <clears throat> is where you go in and they tell you, um, you say you're guilty or not guilty and they can set a bond, like you get before a judge, right? Rundo has no legal process to get before a judge of any kind right now because of the Ninth Circuit's extraordinary uh, order. That's what they were guaranteeing, the, the DOJ. They were guaranteeing, yes, of course we will give him an opportunity to challenge his detention. That's what they lied to his, PD, his public defender about. That's what they lied to Magistrate Judge Kim about. They said, of course we're going to give him that opportunity. And then they went to the Ninth Circuit and they secured this order that does not allow Rondo to even see a judge. It's just plain un-American. It's third world stuff. And you're witnessing it in real time. At the hearing before this court, Mr. Rondo orally requested that this court arraign him and provide some amount of the process ordinarily accompanying any arrest, uh, an arrest, excuse me. As the court explained on the record, the court is not comfortable proceeding with an arraignment based on an indictment the court dismissed, right? So Rundo can't say guilty or not guilty because there's no indictment. There are no charges against you. We can't go forward with pleading you guilty or not guilty because there's no charge. The government also has made clear that it does not believe the court may provide the defendant even the opportunity to argue for bail pending appeal. <clears throat> despite the government's previous representations to Mr. Rundo and Magistrate Judge Kim. Now, I should point out for non-lawyers, when he's talking about the DOJ is making these representations to Mr. Rundo, it's not actually to run, he's not, 
Not like the, the Fed prosecutors are talking to Rob. They're saying it to his attorney. So anytime the court is saying an opinion or an order that the defendant did this, or it was represented to the defendant, they're actually, they're obviously talking about the lawyer for the defendant. You're, you're one and the same. And finally, the Ninth Circuit's order forecloses that process, even though the opportunity to request bail accompanies an arrest. But the court does find that Mr. Rundo's arrest was unlawful. First, the arrest warrant Magistrate Judge Kim issued is invalid because it was based on an indictment that this court had dismissed. Rule 9 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, amazing that the judge even has to explain this. It is so obvious that you can't arrest somebody when there are no charges, right? Rule 9 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure provides that the court must issue a warrant for each defendant named in an indictment. Magistrate Judge Kim issued a warrant based on the first superseding indictment, but this court dismissed that indictment, and there is no other charging document that could serve as the basis for an arrest warrant. At this time, there are no charges pending against the defendant. The government argues that the first superseding indictment is somehow still in effect despite this court's dismissal because of the government's pending appeal, which is nonsense, by the way. That's my own editorialization. But the court is unaware of any legal basis for such an argument, which is the extremely polite, nice, judicial way of saying that is nonsense. Uh, and then they're going to quote Chavaria. The United States contends that uh, because it has appealed this court's dismissal of the superseding indictment, there remains a charge pending against the defendants. The United States offers no statute or case law supporting its contention and that appeal nullifies the effect of this court's order. Although the case remains open, there is no pending charge against the defendants. So that's uh, a 2023 case that it's quoting. And then he goes on to say the federal rules of criminal procedure, which provide various mechanisms by which the government may arrest a person, are not simply technical checkboxes the government must follow. Rather, they implement fundamental constitutional rights, such as the Fourth Amendment, which protects against illegal searches and seizures, by the way, for those who don't know. The rules implement the Fourth Amendment's requirements and are instructive of the requirements for issuing warrants generally. The rules also ensure that individuals who face the loss of their liberty, the most significant deprivation short of the deprivation of life, receive adequate due process. And he quotes Smith the United States as saying, the substantial safeguards to those charged with serious crimes cannot be eradicated under the guise of technical departure from the rules. The government treated the Fourth Amendment, due process, and the federal rules of criminal procedure as advisory guidelines instead of foundational constitutional protections and fundamental rules of criminal procedure. That's just, that's all his number one. <laughs> He's saying, this arrest was unlawful. My first point is this, and that's all we just read. Second point, this court lacks the legal authority to continue to hold Mr. Rundo in custody. Point blank, perfectly succinct statement. There is no, legally, there is no legal authority to hold Rundo in custody right now. The court dismissed the first superseding indictment because it found that the government's prosecution of defendants violated the Constitution. The fact that the government appealed the court's dismissal order does not change the fact that there are no charges pending against the defendants at this time. Quote, it would run completely afoul of the Constitution for the court to simply order that a person sit in jail because at some unknown point in the future, an appellate court might reverse the order that dropped the charges against him. End quote. And that's a quote of United States v. Hudson, uh, a Ninth Circuit case from 2014. Wait, no, it's not. Reversed on other grounds and remanded some of them. So no, that the reversed on other grounds, the, the case is from 2014 that reversed that case on other grounds. Anyway, not from 2014, but it doesn't have a year attached to it. So let's assume it's 2014. To the extent the government argues that Section 3143C of the Bail Reform Act allows the court to detain Mr. Rundo pending the government's appeal, the court is unpersuaded. Another district court rejected that very argument less than six months ago after a careful review of the applicable statute and precedent. And that's the case they quoted earlier, Chavaria, explaining that when a court directs its attention to Section 3142, uh, pursuant to Section 3143C, and discovers that it does not apply because the defendant no longer is charged with an offense, the court's authority to detain a defendant cannot be found therein. In short, Section 3143C explains that the court should treat a defendant in a case in which the United States has taken an appeal in accordance with Section 3142. There's a lot of legalese. Basically, for that section to apply, the defendant must be charged with an offense, which Rundo is not, because the 
indictment was dismissed. It's like such an elementary thing that it's amazing the judge even has to spell this out for the government. But he's really spelling it out for the Ninth Circuit. Here there is no charge defense. The court dismissed the first superseding indictment and ordered Mr. Rundo immediately released. There are no longer any charges or detention order against Mr. Rundo. Accordingly, that section of the law cannot serve as a basis to hold Mr. Rundo pending appeal. So he says this over and over and over. It's a little redundant when he's saying this is dismissed. And not only was this case dismissed and all the charges dismissed, but they were dismissed because of the government's unconstitutional selective prosecution of this guy. Which makes this just all the more outrageous. The court recognizes that the Ninth Circuit clearly intended Mr. Rundo to remain in custody until it could hear from both parties regarding the government's emergency motion to hold Mr. Rundo in custody during the pendency of the government's appeal. This court cannot and does not question that order. But that is all the Ninth Circuit did. It did not authorize Mr. Rundo's rearrest after he had already been released. The Ninth Circuit's administrative stay was moot as soon as it was issued because Mr. Rundo had already been released. And this is my commentary, which the government had a duty to tell the Ninth Circuit, and they didn't. Back to the opinion. To be sure, this is an unusual procedural posture, which is to say that the legal circumstances here are unusual, to say the least, which we've beaten to death. But it is clear to the court that Mr. Rundo should not have been rearrested based on an invalid arrest warrant and that this court lacks any authority to continue to hold him in detention. Had the Ninth Circuit been properly and timely informed of the actual status quo that Mr. Rundo had already been released, it may have either allowed him to remain out of custody, maintaining the status quo, or identified another acceptable basis to detain him. But the government deprived the Ninth Circuit of the opportunity to address that issue. Instead, the government came back to the district court, which would normally have lost jurisdiction because it was on appeal, to request an arrest warrant. That act created much of the procedural uncertainty that now confronts the parties and the courts. Magistrate Judge Kim erroneously, but understandably, issued an arrest warrant leading to Mr. Rundo's present detention. For all these reasons, this court orders that Mr. Rundo be released. However, because of the Ninth Circuit's most recent order, the court cannot release Mr. Rundo. Therefore, the court stays this order, releasing Mr. Rundo, pending further direction from the Ninth Circuit. I have never, in all my years, seen an order quite like that one. Outrageous. What an amazing situation. We're in a constitutional crisis right now because of the Rise Above movement. <laughs> well, because of the government's hard-on for the Rise Above movement. We're in a constitutional crisis at this very moment. Let's go back to the... Uh, back to the... Uh, comments here. I haven't checked in with you all in a while. Are there any clandestine legal groups for fascist leaning lawyers? I've met a couple in Florida since I moved here and they desire to network with like-minded attorneys without facing public backlash. My guy, uh, I'm pretty sure my email address is in the description here. Yes, it is. If you look in the description on YouTube, you'll see my email address. I'm not saying that there is such a network. Um, we are absolutely not promoting fascism on crime and punishment. This is a legal podcast, but uh, you should probably email me, buddy, and have those lawyers email me because I'm also in Florida. Let's just get coffee and talk about democracy. T-Rad Dad, oh, Trad Dad, <laughs> says uh, Judeo-Christian liberal democracy really has been weighing the scales of justice lately. Communism in disguise or decadence? <clears throat> well, yeah. Selective law and order is apparent, says Trad Dad. Why Student Transmission says they're using the alternative, uh, alternative slash academic definition of supremacist, which is different than someone who claims superiority over others. In the book, you say, yes, I still have your book. It's right over there to my right. <laughs> I'm going to review that one day on crime and punishment. It's been, uh, boy, ever since my arrest uh, for Charlottesville, going to jail for a month, uh, it's just been, been a wild time over here, buddy. 
Edonius uh, must have missed the communist march in New York City. Uh, Tars Tarkas. Wait a second. Tars Tarkas from, uh, from John Carter of Mars, or Princess of Mars? We were just talking about that earlier. He says, the law is whatever they say the law is. There is no rule of law. Yeah, that's where we're at now. Uh, that's what I'm saying. The liberals are finally waking up to that fact. They've been in this delusional fantasy of theirs for decades, for a hundred years, for a full century now. They've been pretending that this is all law, law, law. It has nothing to do with politics. Now they're finally getting, this has everything to do with politics. Barrison Jedrick says, do you have any comment on how they are going after Americans that attended the J6 rally and never actually went into the Capitol but stayed on the fringe, stepped on the grass at most? I feel like we should do an episode just on J6. That's one of the tricky ones because I have one of those cases. I am not an attorney of record on the Rise Above Movement case. Um, so I can talk about that all I want. Uh, there are other cases where I've got pretty high profile cases and, uh, I, I don't talk about them because I don't want them, you know, opposing counsel, that is the government, uh, bringing this podcast into court, you know, and playing it for the judge. And I certainly don't want them knowing our legal strategy. Now for Charlottesville, and I've talked at length about Charlottesville, I've, done two podcast episodes here. I talked about it on Cantwell's show because Charlottesville is such an out of control, corrupt process and everybody knows it. And we've already filed the motions in court. They know what our legal arguments are. Like there's nothing that talking about this program is going to do to affect the Charlottesville prosecutions. Um, and by the way, they're the ones feeding all this information to Molly Conger and the Antifa journalists. So that's a different scenario, right? All they can do is come in and whine to the judge that I said something on my podcast. You know, it's not going to affect anything. Everybody knows how corrupt these people are. Everybody knows it's an illegal prosecution. They already know our position. We're at war here. J6 and, and you know, the, the Order of the Black Sun case here in Orlando, things like that, uh, or, you know, the Patriot Front case that I had in Boston, like I don't talk about things like that on the program because they're live wires uh, for, for many reasons. So one day, Bears and Jetterix will have to do uh, an episode just on J6, but I'm afraid it will probably be after the trial for this J6 case that we have. So not to put you off, but there's a, you know, legal reason for that. Spirit of the Age, is there any burden of proof at all when they file an arrest warrant? No. I mean, you've got to show probable cause, but no. That's the problem with this system that we've got. Until relatively recently, <clears throat> it's like Derek, right, in American History X, uh, you know, preaching at the table, the, dinner, the lunch table, I guess. It didn't look like dinner time. But he's preaching about, we have, you know, vested cops with uh, this authority because there's some inherent trust in this system and we believe that cops are going to do the right things. And this is Nazi Derek talking, right? Uh, that is obviously not true anymore. It used to be. Nazis, Republicans, liberals, they all agreed on that a mere 30, 40 years ago. Where we are now, everyone agrees that cops are out of control. You're far right, you're far left, you're a Trump conservative, you're a liberal who hates the overturning of Roe v. Wade, it does, whatever. Wherever you are on the spectrum, everyone agrees now, cops are out of control. And yet, no one will rein them in because they all want to use the cops against their political enemies. It is what Hobbes called the war of all against all. What I've been telling people for over 10 years now was coming, and now we're there. Florida Treasure, hello, just tuned in. Hey now, Florida Treasure. Illegal word I can't say without getting banned on, <laughs> on uh, YouTube. Says, I just tuned in. Has he discussed the case of Thomas Rousseau? No, I have not. And I haven't uh, because of the same reason 
that I'm not talking about the J6 case or the Order of the Black Sun case because I don't want to affect Rousseau's uh, case. So I'll just put it that way. I, there are things going on right now I don't want to affect. I'll talk about my own case all day long. And uh, the other co-defendants, we've all got the same cases, you know. Um, I'm not going to address Rousseau until certain things unfold. But I will. I uh, absolutely will. Just let's tune in next week and I'll, I'll probably talk about it then. This guy with another... Man, we got a lot of offensive names in here that I can't even read on this program. The first rule for clandestine legal groups is that we do not talk about clandestine legal groups. Yes, thank you. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Doom Paul. Oh, man. How's it going? Thank you for your input, Augustus. We are always at war with East Asia. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. Right? So 1984. The trippy thing about 1984 and George Orwell, the guy fought for the communists. He was a communist. He fought against Franco and the fascists. And this guy who wrote the ultimate textbook for communists... Uh, like the playbook for communists, I should say, was himself a communist. But anyway, yeah, we're always at war with East Asia. Now, you know, it used to be we're, we're at war with the Muslims, we're at war with Iraq, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda. Now it's, uh, you know, gov- anti-government types and uh, Nazis, and now it's white nationalists, now it's Trump Republicans. Like the, the enemy keeps changing, keeps shifting, but we're always at war with them. The Matt Hale case and Illinois case stories. Do you have time for that? <coughs> well, we don't have time for that today. Oh my goodness. We have been doing this for two hours. We're an hour over time, buddy. But what do you want to talk about? Maybe we can uh, talk about it next week. Um. Because that's obviously not a live case, the the original case anyway. So I feel like I'm at liberty to talk about that uh, because I learned about it in law school. They teach you about Matt Hill's case in law school to tell you you don't have a right to practice law. If you're a vile white supremacist, you can be barred from practicing law. They use his case as the example. Um, he says, thank you for replying, illegal guy whose name I can't say without getting banned from YouTube. Thanks for replying. Looking forward to your synopsis of his case. Absolutely. Hopefully I can talk about it next week. Um, that's all I can say. Just check in next week and we'll hopefully talk about it. For the record, says the guy who, the other guy whose name I can't say on this program. For the record, my name is not intended to be offensive. <laughs> but sadly, even something so innocent can be spun by YouTube hall monitors. Exactly. Exactly. All right, guys. Um, Let's end it there. We are so over time. I got things to do. You got things to do. We'll check back in next week and hopefully have uh, some more news for you. Let me type in the website so you can go here. Please get on the um, email list uh, for when we are eventually banned from everything again. And here is the viral style. Go ahead and uh, send us some delicious t-shirt money. And, oh, uh, Twitter, Emperor Invictus. I'm on Twitter. Uh, Go there. I post legal news every day. And uh, we'll check in with you all next week. Till then, everybody.